But I'll tell you a story about when I was younger, I became obsessed with survival kits. A bit like Sam, I want to Altman building his bunker. I wanted to go one step further and say, look. But again, I'm not an, uh, um, a psychologist. I'm not an educational psychologist. I'm not a psychotherapist. Um, I'm a chemist trying to find the origin of life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but I do agree. But I am fascinated with the emergence of new technologies and how they f affect our society. Mm. And I think that we will deal with that. I think right now we've got a power struggle going on between, you know, regulation. Um, like, you know, I don't want to feel bad about burning fossil fuels. If you're going to regulate and say, well, don't burn fossil fuels and make it illegal, then fine. I'll comply. I want to obey the law. Um, but until you make it illegal, I'm going to burn as much fossil fuel as right. I can. And why am I going to burn it? Because I'm going to generate knowledge. And if I, you allow me to generate knowledge by burning fossil fuel, I might just help generate the next technology that allows us to leave fossil fuels behind. So that's what I'm saying. So then banning it, that's an argument against the regulation of banning it, no? Exactly. Well, you don't want to regulate against it. What you want to do is you want to basically... You want to manage risk, right? The risk of CO2 in the atmosphere increasing the temperature on the planet so such that you're going to have mass migration. Look, the good news about CO2 increase is we're going to have more, the planet's going to get greener. There's going to be more life on Earth, not less. Bad news is we probably have to all move to northern Siberia. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, you know, that's that's a lot of people, right? Yeah. And there's people going to, so there's going to be waters, uh, water for shortages. And, you know, we just need to think sensibly about how we're going to clean up the planet. Right now, we don't have enough energy to remove the CO2 from planet Earth. But when we get to fusion, we'll be able to fix all that CO2 mm. because we'll have enough energy to do it. And then we'll be able to think about where to place it. So there's all these different structures. Like, you know, Victorian England was a horrible place in terms of coal and air pollution. But we cleaned it up. Yes. We got there. There were new technologies. So again, we have to build new technologies as fast as we can. Like what I'm doing with Chemify, just building more molecular technologies. Yeah. Cleaner ways to make molecules faster. Great. So I just Let think... innovation win. Yeah, 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 exactly. So there's a lot to be done there. But, um, you know, I have, a, I have so many day jobs, right? <laughs> One of them is probably not being a, uh, I like to not being a, I suppose, a, 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 an arbiter of how our culture should evolve. But I am part of the culture and I am thinking and what I am just saying to everyone is, please, let's enable each other to think critically. The yes. gift we can give each other is the ability to think critically yes. and not just make stuff up because it sounds good. Yes. And I think, again, I think to your point, as we as we mature with these tools we've been given, there will get to a point where people who people will eventually see the chickens come home to roost on those who just throw around things that make no sense. And eventually you'll have enough movement where people break with that later and say, wait a minute, they said all this stuff was true and it's verifiably not that you will form people who are like, maybe I shouldn't just look at 280 characters and make a determination of what someone thinks. Not to say I'm going to go suddenly be some expert reading all the peer-reviewed papers that are written sometimes in another language, but there's a middle ground there. Yeah, you know yeah, I mean? yeah. I have so many people who like use my ex account as a argue with me and say, oh, I thought you're a horrible person. And I'm like, I just tweet random things <laughs> to make it to, to offend you into thinking, right? I'm like... You know, I just tweet random things to offend you into thinking. That's a bio. You should make that your your X bio. My, yeah. I mean, I try not to so much now because, like, I mean, X is pretty noisy at the moment. It's very noisy. Yeah. It's, um, so, and also, you know, people, I think, went through the pandemic when we, we went through quite an interesting shock during the pandemic. But um, I don't know. Uh, it's, it's fascinating to watch. I think that we need to stop... Um, over generalizing on some things and and let humans generate new technologies sure. and you know and and take it from there but yeah I don't, I don't know what maybe i should make a new type of quantum teleportating <laughs> computing <laughs> computing you'll get there multiverse after this race you'll get there yeah yeah exactly what's we, we we put a pin a little earlier in time you uh -huh. started to talk about that and then and then we didn't get into it to it how People have some, especially like scientists, they, they have some interesting theories on this. You mentioned Sir Roger Penrose and like, I think you said like it doesn't exist. Like what is your theory on time and what it is? I mean, I guess I can answer that. If you want, we can go to assembly theory because if you want... If it's, it's a part of it, then yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that. assembly theory is kind of like, for me, 
helped me get where I am. And I mean, I've always, since I was a kid, felt that I'm existing in a flux of time, mm. right? And I always, and for me, time is non-negotiable. It's just, it, it's not a, it's not a coordinate. <laughs> it's an action, right? It's, it's the process of change. And I think in physics, the way we label things, again, it, it, we lose something like the way we label things in language. But I, it's probably better to come at it from assembly theory um, because I think it naturally leads to a new conceptualization that anyone can understand and actually kind of, um, you know, go, it, it opens up a new way of looking at the world. Okay. When, when did, when did, I'm trying to think the order we should do this in. The two questions would be obviously, can you define assembly theory as best as possible for the layman to understand? And secondly, whether you want to answer this first or, or after you answered the first one, wh when did you, how did you come up with this? Was this like a, a long time thinking about it and it kind of morphed into, oh shit, or was this like a ah -ha kind of moment? I think both. I mean, like I say, I've only ever had one idea. It's just no one's noticed. <laughs> Um, I, um, was always fascinated by the spirit in the object, you know, this kind of, oh, things have a, they have a, and, and I, I didn't realize I was solely poorly educated and, um, and also didn't read enough philosophy. Right. I think, you know, Leibniz and, and Henri Bergson and a few others kind of basically saw the ghost in the machine. Mm. Um, and but I'll tell you a story about when I was younger, I became obsessed with survival kits, a bit like Sam or one of Altman building his bunker. I wanted to go one step further and say, look, what is the minimum amount of stuff I would need to reproduce my technology so that I could live comfortably? Hmm. Now, let's not think about microprocessors and chat GPT and all that stuff. But what I mean, how could I produce my own pharmaceuticals, clean water, food, tools, shelter? You know, what would I need? And so, like, basically, I could have a list of things that I would need. And then, critically, I'd also want to make sure that they would self be self-perpetuating. Um, um, uh, uh, like, I would need machines that would allow me to make the machines that make the machines. Yes. So it's like, so what is the minimum I need, right? The minimum amount of stuff I would need to basically have a self-sustaining society for Lee. And then I thought, okay, that's cool. I can think of, imagine that. It's like, now what, how could I compress that down? Because <laughs> that's quite a lot of stuff. Yes. And so, you know, and, I'm, and, I, and I remember uh, I had this survival book on how to survive. And then I thought, oh, I could have this massive, you know, farm and food and equipment and, you know, you know forest and all this stuff and water and like, you know. And I was like, well, why can I, com can I compact this down into what I can put on the back of a truck? And then can I get it into a briefcase? And then I go smaller into a case. And then how could I get into a matchbox? Mm. And that was really the invention of assembly theory. Because in the matchbox, in I guess, looking at it, it's why I became obsessed. In the matchbox, I was like, what is the minimum set of tools I could use to make other tools, to make other tools, to make other tools, to make other tools, to recreate my way of life now? So what is the minimum I would need and that would interact with the environment as given pretty much anywhere so I could just survive? Mm. And, you know, it was a razor blade, a mirror, uh, maybe some some cable, you know, just all these things I could get together. So that was kind of really in a way, if you assembly theory is just um, a way of say, saying, what is the minimum amount of stuff I need, um, of knowledge or things or objects I need? When I combine them together, I can generate other things that will act back on the chain to generate other things. So it's this recursion within a line. So it's a bit, so um, so the assembly theory in one line just basically says the past matters. But I'm like, okay, we probably need a little bit more information yeah. than that. So, <laughs> so what I mean is like every event that is occurring has some function of the events that have happened in the past. I call them contingency, right? Okay. So, um, and then the things that happened before that. And so, and if you could map that and put it on a line, on a graph, and, and count the information required at each step to make the, ne make the next step happen, you would be able to kind of explain the mechanism where you could go from something to a quite complex object. So that's kind of assembly theory in a nutshell. Now, how I got to it was I flipped the problem around. And the, the problem was this, that 
I was or I'm obviously want to know why we're here. Well, that led me to origin of life. That led me to understand how did life get started. And then, but then people started kind of getting trapped in defining life. Like, you know, life needs to be this. It needs to replicate. It needs to have a metabolism. It needs to have error correction. And, and you got all this list of requirements for life. And I was like, gee whiz, um, that's a really long list. And everyone was arguing about what the requirements are. And I was like, is there one thing that life does that non-life doesn't do that would allow you to tell that a system was alive or not? And and it's um, and then another one line to unpack, which I think was a guy, a guy I met at a conference, a guy called Adam Savage, I think. Okay, Mythbusters guy. Yeah, is and he, right? and I was telling him about mm -hmm. assembly theory for an afternoon. He's like, ah, what you mean is that um, life is this thing that, cr that creates complex shit at scale. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's actually not that's kind of along the lines of how I was picturing it. Yeah, yeah. So so what I was doing, I said, oh, you've got all these things you call bit of life, right? L what life does. And I'm a chemist. And I asked myself this one question. How complex does a molecule need to be before you go, that molecule could not have formed randomly um, in the environment without any process of evolution or technology? Meaning you're not going to the lowest level. You're going to the lowest level of what we can define. Yes, I'm defining like the the molecule as a complex enough object. Now, the beginning yeah. that really confused people because the physicists went, no, hang on. In a finite universe, so I have to get this right because I'm probably wrong. In a finite universe where you have infinite time, every state is searchable. In a finite universe where you have infinite time, you can go to every single possible combination. That's what the physicists say. Okay. And I say, for me, my intuition was like, no fucking way. That's impossible. You can't do that. And the physicists are like, what are you talking about? Yeah, why are you saying it's impossible? Of course, of course you can. You have a finite universe, right, finite, and you have infinite time. Infinite. Look. And I'm like, oh, yeah, okay. But that doesn't actually happen, right? So then when I realized, as, um, if I then qualified it and said, look, as a chemist, the reason I viscerally felt this, is I really had to do this over a number of years. I realized that when chemists measure molecules, they don't measure one molecule. They measure a large number of identical molecules. They have to. That's how the technique works. Yes. It's like, ah. So what I mean is, if I have a complex molecule that I have a lot of copies, and I know I've got a lot of copies, there's going to be a threshold at which I have so many copies and I have so complicated, it can't possibly have assembled itself by chance. And like the example you could use would be an iPhone. Like if you go to Mars and you find a thousand iPhones or if you find 30,000 Teslas or you find, you know, um, uh, like all of Van Gogh's paintings or something like this, there's going to be a threshold where you go, huh, this did not randomly occur. And that was the birth of assembly theory. So then mm. what I did is I then suddenly said, I, then I took this stuff and I said, well, how can I measure complexity in molecules? And I found a way to do it using uh, what chemistry used spectroscopy. So spectroscopy is a process of shining light on things. Mm -hmm. And you can then basically, uh, the, the molecule absorbs the light. And the more parts the molecule has, the more colors it absorbs mm. because of the rules of quantum mechanics. Yeah. And so that's where assembly theory came out. And basically, and we did came up with the assembly equation and worked out that suddenly, if I can t take a sample and I can find a molecule that has more than, say, 15 parts in it, and I can measure it in the lab, I know the biology we produced it. So are you saying that this is, but this would be going towards explaining creation itself because you're going to the molecular level and saying there's a, there, are, there are unique molecules that we can prove in a lab that because there's now a bigger supply of them, we know it had to come from that, meaning like it's selected for that molecule yep. and expanded. Yeah, yeah. and then it will basically look at the what is a minimum configuration where you literally put atoms in, individual atoms, or a lot of atoms that aren't many bonds, just simple stuff, and you get complex stuff out. Like, yeah. like the cell is literally a complexity generator. It just builds stuff, right? It doesn't infinitely build stuff because you don't need it or it's just enough for the combinatorial space. But there's a lot of features on this, right? It's so deep in that, but, but I had to start somewhere. So, and remember, I was kind of doing this um, a lot on my own 
and then a lot in collaboration with Sarah Walker yeah. and her team. Thank you guys for checking out this clip. If you haven't already subscribed, please subscribe and hit the like button on this video. It is a huge, huge help. And if you'd like to check out this clip's full podcast episode, that link is in the description below or right here. And finally, you can follow me on Instagram and X by using the links in my description below.